Well, brothers and sisters, uh, my name is Ojinga Kamisi, and this is WAIF Cincinnati. I am talking to, having a nice, uh, wonderful interview with uh, Dr. Spira, and, uh, or Professor Spira, Dr. Professor, a uh, brother. He's a lot of those things. But um, good brother, good brother. Uh, and you would think, a brother that fast all the time, a brother that lost all this weight, a brother that looks very healthy now, you see him, you talk to him, he's very healthy. But then when you hear him blow that slide trombone, you say you need about 400 pounds to blow that horn, don't you? And no, he doesn't. He's got a lot of energy, got a lot of energy when he blows it. So, brothers and sisters, 513-749-1444 is the number. 513-749-1444 is the number. If you would like to call in and uh, speak to Professor Spira about his latest book, uh, Dialogues and Essays on the Mucusless Diet Healing System, Volume 1, 2, and 3. Uh, do call in. But before we do that, and you can start calling right now, but uh, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, Arnold Eric and the Mucusless Diet Healing System? Yeah, definitely. Uh, yes, most definitely. Uh, Arnold Eric, he... Uh, was born in, uh, in Germany and came up in Europe in the late 1800s. And he was uh, diagnosed with something called Bright's disease, inflammation in the kidneys. And he was basically given a death sentence. They said, ah, there's nothing we can do for you. And he had some money, so he was able to go all over Europe to all the best doctors and check everything out. Nobody had anything for him. He went and started checking out. Uh, natural healing there was a, a movement back to nature movement that was getting started so there were people that started having these uh, little communes and things where people were starting to eat uh, you know the plant based diet this vegan diet as they say as I say mucus free is the original vegan diet and uh, and so he would get a little bit of relief when he ate those uh, a better as he ate more vegetarian foods and stuff fast a little bit but he could never really get over the hump and he had got to a point where he was just like i'm just gonna i'm just gonna starve myself to death so i'm just gonna kill myself and i'm just gonna stop eating and what he found out was when he stopped eating he actually got better and within two weeks he had healed himself of this bright's disease that he was supposed to die of and so the brilliance and genius of eric sort of came through where he started putting things together like well, wait a minute then what is it about the foods that i was eating before where i couldn't heal and then i fasted and i was able to heal so over time and as he he uh, later put together a sanitarium where he uh, became well known for helping save the lives of thousands of people that had been declared incurable they had come to his sanitarium and he would put them through transition diet fasting and uh, and get people back on their feet. Uh, he ended up migrating to the United States uh, right before World War One, and uh, and that's where he uh, continued to write and publish uh, his books about uh, a lot of the experiences that he had uh, hel helping people. All that knowledge that he had gained came out in uh, you know rational fasting, mucus's diet healing system, a couple other texts. And uh, so, yeah, so that was, uh, uh, you know, Arnold Eret. He he uh, died tragically mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in the early 1920s, and it's his fishy because nobody saw it. it. Supposedly, he tripped and fell on the back of his head, and uh, it, was, it was supposed to be kind of slippery. He had just given a lecture. Mm -hmm. On, uh, on on the grape cure, as they say, uh, kind of grape juice, grape eating, fast uh, fasting methods. And uh, nobody was there to see it. And then his uh, confidant, Fred Hirsch, found him and 
And that's as the story goes. A lot of us think that there was foul play involved, mm-hmm. that that was just one of them things where at that time, Eric, I mean, they they tried to write Eric out of the history books because you – you should already know about Eric. You should, shouldn't be the first time you hear about him, but they did a really good job at suppressing the history of him. I mean, all of this back to nature stuff, all the stuff in the fifties and the sixties with the hip with, with with hippie culture and back to nature. Uh, this could be connected in with the with the back to nature aspect of the Rasta piece. Uh, that's something that I actually want. I want to write an article about that at some point. To that I haven't seen many. Uh, things that really connect the European back to nature movement with uh, back to nature movement of the African diaspora and how that all hooked together. But this was a this was a worldwide consciousness, and Eric was at the forefront of that, and they couldn't let that type of uh, charisma, you know, just sort of c- continue to make this this movement happen because the meat and the dairy industries were 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 going to be done. And uh, so, you know, so that's that's Professor Arnold Eret, his uh, uh, Fred Hirsch, who had also who had healed himself of of a really bad chronic uh, ailment of his legs where he couldn't walk without crutches. Uh, Eret personally fasted him and he healed and he got off his crutches. And so he dedicated his life to promoting Eret's work. And so for the next several decades into the 70s, uh, Fred Hirsch promoted the work then here in cincinnati uh brother victor buttram uh he he got a hold of the mucus's diet and then that's who introduced it to brother air and then you know brother air introduced it to me you know and so this is uh you know air air's torch as we say you know you look on his book there's a there's a torch with an e and that's the air flame you know the air torch uh and that's just something that we feel really passionate about passing on because it's this information is needed you know it's just needed by by you know the brothers and sisters because a lot of the pain and suffering that we're going through we don't have to we just don't have to if we know better you know if we know better we can do better and it's time to uh like we like to say get out the sandbox you know it's time to it's time to grow up we got to get serious and see uh what we can do with a with a clean body you know that's that's not super stimulated Speaking of uh, vegetarianism and veganism, and a lot of people um, are saying they're either or or they're both. You know, they vegetarian slash uh, vegan. What are your thoughts on veganism uh, versus vegetarianism, or uh, do they work hand in hand together? Yeah, that's a good question. I did a little bit of research on the history of these words and terms and something about pus and mucus culture that things always end up worse than the original vision. So the original vision of the word vegetarianism was to be fruit and vegetable eaters. Yet there was, uh, if you, you look at the history of these uh, vegetarian societies, many of which they were, were European, and then they started having some in the U.S., but these were very cliquish uh, you know, the affluent, aristocratic kind of folks that didn't, you know, they, they were kind of on their high horse and stuff. But they were the ones, some of the ones that kind of started some of these uh, these formal societies. Uh, and so there was a fight in the vegetarian societies since the late 1800s where there was some that was saying, well, look, we we want to exclude eggs and fish and, and you know we want to have basically what they call veganism today and and so there was a lot of you know back and forth uh and then it wasn't until 1942 when uh uh i think a gentleman named watson that was in the uh, vegetarian one of the vegetarian societies coined the term vegan as a way to say people that didn't deal with any kind of animal products uh, so it was one of those instances where vegetarian really should have been used to mean that, but it but it didn't. And uh, well, we got a call coming in, and um, uh, we can go into some more detail about that. But um, uh, this is Talking Drum, and I do it this way. I call it Talking Drum Live. State your name and where you're calling from. Uh, my name is Lenny. I'm calling from Mount Arbor. Okay, how you doing, Lenny? Pretty good. And uh, what, what I was calling about. 
someone, and I'm trying to get some clarity on this because I, I was on Facebook, and I know not to, uh, I don't trust everything I read on the internet. And I was reading a post by a sister named Nzinga, and she was posting about uh, vegetarianism versus uh, eating eating meat, and that that there's some uh, certain certain I guess vitamins such as B12 that are essential to to uh, to the diet uh, for humans that, that are necessary that aren't found in uh, the pure vegan diet. And I just wanted to know, could the brother address that? And what I'll do is I'll just hang up and listen to the response if that's okay. All right, that's, uh, that's fine and a uh, good question. Thank you very much. All, All right. right. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Lenny. That's a good question, and that's a very common question. Here's where we, the, uh, what, what we do and the way we think and, and live our lives gets very different from everybody else, uh, where we do not deal with these concepts of a lot of these nutrition concepts. These nut- Look at the origin of these nutrition concepts. These are coming from uh, a very Eurocentric paradigm. These are based, it, it, the, the, the foundation of nutrition theories are based in pus and mucus eating. What vegetarians and vegans have tried to do is come in and use these theories of nutrition, we call it the additive principle, that try to use these concepts of metabolism and, and try to ad- adapt it as if you had to prove that the natural way of eating is is, is, is superior to the meat eating. What we do is we just scrap the whole concept. Now, uh, if you go to my website, mucusfreelife.com, uh, I actually have an article on B12, and I look at the history of that theory. And after examining, the, objectively examining the history of that theory, uh, I come to the conclusion that it's not a useful theory. So I don't believe in the B12 theory, and I know many people that have... Uh, not consumed anything that is supposed to have B12 in it, uh, and they're fine. And so, again, this is one of the things where we've been hoodwinked and bamboozled continually by this medical establishment and this this Western dietetic establishment uh, uh, for believing these concepts so they can sell more stuff. All right, well, we have another call, and we're going to take this call. Uh, Greetings and welcome to Talking Drum, and state your name and where you're calling from. Uh, Hello, yeah, this is Charles from Washington, D.C. All right. Uh, How you doing, Charles? I just wanted to ask, all right, I just wanted to, uh, for the brother to uh, give me some kind of concept on um, the How to Eat to Live by Elijah Muhammad and to touch on... Uh, fish, because a lot of people, you know, they don't eat meat, but they consider fish poultry, and they don't consider consider fish. And I just want you to expound on that on the fish and the how to eat to live. All right, brother. Well, thank you very much for your call. All right. All right. All right. Peace. All right. So that's that's another good question. So let's deal with this fish real quick. So I I, I don't, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but fish is absolutely and, the. W- and let me say one thing: uh, we got another caller uh, on on hold, so just stay there with us, caller. So we'll come to you next after he answers this question. Yeah, so uh, fish is is actually the worst meat that you could eat. Now, why is that? Think about it. Fish doesn't even breathe air. The breathing process is a cleansing process. Every time you breathe the oxygen in, you, you cleanse the body. So an animal that breathes air is fundamentally going to be cleaner, a cleaner organism than something that gets its oxygen through gills in the water. And you can tell as soon as that fish comes out, though, it already smells nasty. It smells like fish. We have a word that if something smells like fish, it smells bad. So fish is something that we recommend getting off of immediately. We don't even say use that to transition. Fish is, you know, we we just recommend getting off that uh, as soon as possible. Uh, As far as the book, uh, the Elijah Muhammad book, uh, I mean, I'm not an authority on that. You know, I read it years ago. and I know that there's a lot of it, it doesn't go as far as mucus's diet in terms of, you know, what's there. And, and people have said that, you know, there's, 
that you know that that Elijah Muhammad. I guess maybe it was Dr. CBS said Elijah Muhammad didn't want to go uh, really far. Uh, because people weren't ready. But I recommend check out the Mucus's Diet Healing System by Professor Arnold Eric. And we're going to go to our next caller. But the other thing I just wanted to say about fish, uh, after I talked to uh, Brother Eric, uh, that wasn't the only reason, but that was a good reason to stop. He told me, think about it. He said, a fish has its babies in the water. <laughs> a fish poops in the water. And if we, if we know... Some scientists may know that a fish pees in the water. So a fish is swimming in his filth as if the fish was in your toilet in your bathroom. Mm. And then you just drop a hook down, you pick it up, you clean it, and then you fry it and you eat it. So do you want something out of a toilet? And so that was the concept. That was, <laughs> that's what he said to me. It's yeah. kind of raw. And I said, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got me on that. But we're going to go yeah. to our next caller. This is Talking Drum Live. State your name and where you're calling from, and welcome. Hey, Dr. Drum, it's me, Blair, calling from Warren County, Lebanon, Ohio. All right, and thank you, Blair, for being out there. All right. Uh, 513-749-1444 is the number. 513-749-1444. This is Talking Drum and I call it Talking Drum Live. When you call in, it's live. Uh, uh, welcome and state yeah, your name so where you're coming from. brother Ricky Evans, the musician, the Willie, Willie Smart's friend, you know him. Yeah, I ate some sardines the other day. I've been vomiting all day. I feel better now. Okay, so but... Fish, you know, so we had agreement. That's all I want to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. 513 uh, is the number. 513 1444 we're talking about and, and this is opportune time to, to give your website a phone number or email if you have it um, and you know some people will want to know where they can find uh, uh, your book so yeah website everything most everything you need to know is right on the website mucusfreelife.com that's mucusfreelife.com uh, and then my email info at mucusfreelife dot com, and uh, but just yeah, go go to the website, check us out there, and uh, you know that that's that's gonna be your uh, you know your your one stop shop for all things mucus's diet. Five one three seven four nine fourteen forty four. Five one three seven four nine fourteen forty four. We're talking about the mucus's diet healing system, but um, Professor Spira. He has a book called Spirit Speaks, and it's Dialogues and Essays on the Mucusless Diet Healing System, Volume 1, 2, and 3. And so uh, it's a must-read, I'm sure. And um, I got my copy right here, and I'm going to start reading. On the back, he says here, warning, this book could change your life. And, you know, brothers and sisters, anytime you got something that is going to change your life, in terms of, of a healthy uh, way, uh, you all need to uh, look at that a little closer because there are so many people with so many ailments. And, you know, all the time that, um, uh, and, and I say this periodically from time to time, and not just as to be humorous, but most people get a good laugh out of it. But it was an uh, elderly lady that I knew from my old neighborhood, and she would say, you know, Ojinga, um, I got that restless leg syndrome. And I said, uh, you got that restless leg syndrome. What, what, where did you get it? How do you think you got it? She said, well, the television told me that I got this restless leg syndrome. And I said, you mean you looked at the television. Mm. It said you had something, and you just went on with that. And so she said, yeah. And she said, my legs feel kind of funny. I said, you know what? Here's what I recommend to you. Now, I'm a drummer and a a drum uh, maker and, and all of that stuff, a drum player. I said, but um, they call me Dr. Drum sometimes. I said, but here's what I suggest to you. Uh, when doctors give out their uh, uh, diagnosis, prognosis, or whatever uh, to you, uh, I said, this is mine to you. I said, sit your ass down. I said, the tail live vision will tell you anything. If you're going to listen to the tail-eye vision tell you that you got less, restless leg syndrome, 
and there is really nothing wrong with your legs, and it didn't start happening until you listened to the Tell Life Vision. And I said that to say that there are many brothers and sisters will listen to the Tell Life Vision, and you'll hear things about diet, never any, never any word called live it. It's diet. And so uh, when I heard the Rasta say that, I just love that word, live it, as opposed to diet, mm. you know, because it's your live it. You, you, you're doing this fasting. You're doing things to, to live, not to die, because diet has the word die in it. Live it has the word live in it. But we got another call coming in.